This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. I'm Mike Keith with Amy Wells, and look who's sitting right here. It's the director of Pro Scouting, Brian Gardner. 11 years with the Titans. Welcome welcome to the OTP. This is beautiful. Yes, it is. Beautiful. I appreciate well, the, it. The Bed MGM studio is beautiful. Yes, it is. We're very it pleased is. to be here and, and thrilled to have you here. And we're going to visit with some of the folks that work with you in the, mm -hmm. in the football scouting world and right. the research world. Yeah. You handle all of the pro personnel stuff. Yes. So are you scouting teams? Are you scouting players? All of the above? How does that work? Yeah, it's more all of the above. Okay. Basically, for the most part, we have um, the responsibility of advanced scouting, which is scouting our upcoming, uh, upcoming opponents during the season, uh, going in and doing scouting reports, breakdowns on the players on that team, the scheme, anything that we can pick up that we think can help our coaches. A lot of the stuff that we do in advanced scouting is – we try to bring back information that they just can't see on film. Um, our coaches are always very adept at watching the film, breaking down the opponent, but things like injury, tempo, substitutions, all of those things that they don't see between the plays on film is the stuff that we try to bring back uh, in terms of advanced scouting. Uh, we're responsible for scouting individual players for free agency. So along with breaking down those opponents, we're scouting every team in the league, looking at their upcoming free agents, the players that will be available, uh, those players that might come available based on potential cap casualties or salary. And then the other part of us is being aware of the players that are on the street. So uh, I like to refer to us as the 911 people. So when something happens, there's an injury, somebody's hurt, who's out there? So we have to keep tabs on who's on the street, whether it's other leagues, whether it's players that were cut in preseason, players that are available for trade, so whatever it is. So it's individual players, the streets, the advanced scouting portion. So the person who goes to do the advanced scout, mm -hmm. like say for instance, we're getting ready to play Cincinnati. Right. The weekend before, someone will have been assigned to Cincinnati, Baltimore. Yes. Does that person make a presentation to the mm -hmm. coaching staff at the start of Cincinnati week? Yes, yes. So what happens is, is that scout is working a week ahead of the team. So they're preparing for that upcoming opponent a week ahead. Uh, they'll write up all the players, the substitutions, the signals, the, you know, the packages that the team runs, try to break them down schematically by numbers uh, and evaluation, and then they'll physically go to the game a week ahead of the, the opponent. They're there live. Uh, they'll scout the game, bring back that report the next day to the coaches. Uh, typically, we will meet with the offense co offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, uh, the special teams coordinator, and we'll try to give each one of them a breakdown. Uh, and then we'll visit with each individual position coach, hand them a scouting report, answer any questions that they may have about the opponent, and try to give them as much knowledge as we have to try to help them in any way we can. I'm very interested in the player scouting part of what you mm -hmm. guys do yes. because we're coming off of the draft and we talked a lot about right. how players are organized on draft boards mm -hmm. and the horizontal and the vertical boards and all of the things that Coach Mack likes to talk about. Right. Um, you guys have a tremendous volume of humans that you are just trying mm -hmm. to keep tabs on and what they have going on. How do you organize yes. all of that information so when there is a 911 moment, you can right. spin through your Rolodex and boom, here comes a name. 
<laughs> That's interesting. I like how you put that. You don't literally have a role in it. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Close. Close. Well, it's also not yeah. 1965 anymore. <laughs> right. Thank you. I guess that was me. <laughs> we do it in several different ways. So one in, um, we have several um, ready lists. Okay, so when a player is released or cut, each day there's a waiver wire that comes to each team at four o'clock Eastern, three o'clock Central. Uh, we'll comb through that and we'll look at those players. Um, if we haven't already evaluated them, we'll look at the tape. Uh, we'll put a Titan grade on that player and then we'll determine whether or not he is viable for our team. So we'll either tag him as a uh, emergency list player or 911 if he's a veteran guy, a potential practice squad player if he's a young player with three years or less in the league. Uh, and then we will electronically, we have boards, depth charts of 911 players and practice squad eligible players. And so we try to do the work on the front end. You know, we'll typically go over the waiver wire every day. And then once a week, we'll meet and review the entire week's worth of waivers to make sure nobody slipped through the cracks. So then when we have an injury, then all we have to do is electronically pull up that board and it has the players listed by position in a depth chart style, ranked the way that we like them. So then all we have to do is say, okay, say so let's bring these three in for a workout, work them out and then determine you know, who we wanna sign. So we try to do it that way. And then for free agency, kind of a similar process like you were talking about, vertical, horizontal, uh, we have an electronic free agent board that as we go through the teams, we break those players down uh, based on their viability for us, grade them, and then they electronically populate on the board vertically by position and then horizontally by grade. And then, you know, we can pull up a, a board and look at them. It's fascinating. It you is. mentioned a Titans grade. Yes. You've been here for over a decade now. Yes. There have been multiple coaching staffs, different things throughout the years that yeah. have just changed over the course of any team. Sure. Has a Titans grade changed with each new staff, with mm -hmm. each new set of coaches or things that they're looking for? Does yes. that change? It does change because uh, each staff may value a certain position or a certain skill set a little bit more than others. For the most part, the grade is kind of value based, uh, based on the skill set of the player, whether he's an elite player, whether he's a, a top starter, a good starter, et cetera. And then you work all the way down to uh, camp players. But then, you know, as you go through uh, multiple grading scales and multiple regimes. Uh, the big thing is just being able to break down the player based on what the coaching staff values. And so that's why, you know, with Brian Callahan coming in and his staff, we sat down as a scouting staff and a coaching staff together with them and let them tell us you know, hey, these are the things that we value by each position. You know, we had each position coach come in, break down their position, the things that are must haves. So this player must have to be able to do A, B, C, D. You know, these are the things that maybe if he doesn't have, we can get away with. You know, these are the absolutes. If he can't do this, he can't play for us. And so we get that from the coaching staff and then that helps us, you know, in terms of the evaluation. And then as we grade the players and rank them according to the skill set, you know, that determines kind of how much value we put on each guy, whether we really like them or whether or not maybe they fit that skill set, but maybe not quite a fit for us. And so the player may play someplace else and not with us. At the start of free agency, you know that there are the Lloyd Cushenberries and the Kenneth right. Murrays and all those guys. Right. As we get to this time of the year, where we're basically in phase three of free agency, right. how different is your job in pro personnel and pro scouting mm -hmm. at this moment right. where you're trying to find those last veterans who fit the Titans' needs to mm -hmm. potentially go to training camp? Well, it, it evolves. But, you know, like I said, we're the 911 people, so we're always on top of things. Um, good example would be Tyler Boyd, 
a player that we just signed and that we were just bringing in. So he's a player that uh, played in Cincinnati, um, has a history with Brian Callahan, and he was an unrestricted free agent. Um, didn't quite get the offers that he was looking for. We were doing some different things. So it kind of went through the phases and then things started to kind of ramp up, you know, post draft. So we try to keep a, a, a tab on players as they go through free agency. Like you said, we're in those different waves. You got the, the first wave, the big dollars are flowing. Then you have the next wave where guys are kind of visiting. And then we're now in what I call the dust settles phase. And a lot of veteran players are still out there. Some of them because they haven't gotten the offer that they thought they may get. Some of them because maybe the phone isn't ringing. And so we try to value those players based on how they would fit for us. Keep tabs with them, whether it's with the agent, whether, you know, it's just kind of keeping an eye on that, that 911 list we talked about. And then when the time presents itself, we try to, you know, bring them in and see if we can close a deal. But it's tricky, too, because you got some guys, especially guys in their early 30s with families. Mm -hmm. You wonder, how are they coming off of surgery? What kind right. of shape are they in? Have they moved on with their life to where right. do they want to go through this anymore? Yes. You've got a lot of things you have to sort through just to figure out if you want to bring them in. Right. And that's where a lot of these guys are at this point that were unrestricted free agents. Uh, some of the older players, you know, they have to ask themselves, well, do I want to play? Do I want to play for this amount? Uh, do I want to put my body through the rigors? Uh, and then, you know, you have those older players that strategically don't really want to be a part of the off season sure. and training camp. And so that final wave of free agency ends up ramping up in training camp when teams look around, look at the holes, or maybe they have an injury, and then they're those veteran players that are still sitting out there that you know have pelts on the wall that, hey, maybe now, okay, the player may be willing to play for a certain amount and we have a, a need, and so we can look to try to see if we can get them in at that point. How does a person end up walking down this career path? This is such a cool job. I mean, it's, but it's very specific. It's too, so yeah. specific. Yeah. I'm sure that every person watching or listening to this is like, how do I get to do that? <laughs> I ask myself that too. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say I, I backed into it, but you know, when I got into scouting, you know, scouting wasn't, you know, kind of widely known. Um, and it was kind of the haven for a lot of older coaches, guys that had coached in the league and kind of, you know, is in coaching, there's a lot of movement. Coaches move every couple of years, they go from team to team. And when I got into the league, scouting was a lot more stable. And so some of the older coaches had kind of gone through the rigors and decided, well, you know, I got all this knowledge, but I'm tired of moving. You know, I'll, you know, I'll scout. Over the course of time now, it's evolved. We're getting a lot of younger people. Scouting is a lot more visible, especially on the, the college end. Uh, and so, and in college football, uh, they're scouting in personnel departments because of transfer portals sure. and all this stuff. So people are a lot more aware of scouting. And so they get into it earlier, a lot of kids in college work in their uh, college personnel departments, they volunteer and try to gain experience, and then they try to enter as scouting assistants and work their way up. So there's a lot of ways into the, the business. Ex-players, uh, we've got one, Kalen Reed, who worked with us as a former Titan, uh, who found his way into it. Uh, we've got former coaches, we've got, you know, guys who work their way up as young people, you know, through the, the system. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Brian Gardner, who is the director of pro scouting for the Titans. Thanks so much for taking time with us on I the OTP. Appreciate it. Thank you. Pro scouting department is something that has always fascinated me. I will stop Brian Gardner all the time and ask what he's working on because it's just so different than what I perceive. And I think a lot of people perceive scouting is 
Because when they think scouting, they think about the draft. Absolutely. Everybody thinks of what they see when everybody's on the field at the combine or something like that, clocking guys, times, and all of that stuff. But there's so much more to it. It's so broad. He was telling us about things that he does that I never even thought about. But you know who does do college scouting? The director of college scouting. Here he is right here as we switch cameras. (laughs) It's John Salgi. Welcome, John. How are we doing? All right, I want to start with your background, though. Right. Because a lot of people don't realize this is a local guy. Really grew up here since the fourth grade. Um, you know, I claim Tennessee as, as my home. Um, so this is really special. It's, it's really cool working for your hometown team, um, team you grew up watching. I mean, I remember when, when everybody was all excited riding their bikes around the neighborhood when I was a little kid about that, hey, we're gonna get an NFL team here. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a really cool moment. It comes full circle when you get to uh, first step into the organization. When I was, uh, gosh, first time I was here, I was a uh, junior in college when Mr. Adams hired me as an intern. Um, and I was very, very fortunate to work for Floyd Reese and really all the, all the administrations we've had here since then. Just, it's never lost on me how special this is. How did you get on after you finished at the University of Tennessee? <laughs> well, when I finished at the University of Tennessee, um, gosh, I, I thought it would be easy. I thought I'd just walk right back into here and they'd have a job ready for me. Uh, that wasn't the case. Scouting's a pretty competitive field. And at the time we were having success um, or on the tail end of, of what was a very successful run um, in the Steve McNair era. Sure. So. Um, waited my turn a little bit and finally got a phone call about six months after I graduated. They brought me back. I was, uh, I was making film for Floyd uh, Reese. I was, I was making cut-ups for him. So I would come in and uh, sit there until about 11 o'clock at night uh, making cut-ups, old beta tapes and a cowboy remote. And gosh, it was, uh, it was cheap labor. Uh, didn't cost much to get me here. Uh, didn't me- need much at the time. So um, it was, uh, gosh, what a journey, right? Yeah. That's awesome. So now in your current role, you're, you're doing a little bit more than cut-ups, we'll say, as uh-huh. a director of college scouting. Kind of explain to us a little bit what all that entails and what all you're responsible for. Sure. So we've got a staff of area scouts that cover the entire country. We're responsible for every college football player that's draft eligible coast to coast. We have scouts that cover these regions, uh, traditional regions like the Southeast, but we've got some creative ones. Uh, got a new region in the middle of the country that we're carving out this year for a, a younger scout, Matt Miller, on our staff. Um, so sometimes you've got to get creative based on where the players are. Uh, you can't let geography uh, get in the way because if you're not careful, you ask one guy to cover two thirds of the country. So there's strategy that's involved. Um, Where are the players? Do we need to adjust the lines of the different areas on a year to year basis to make sure that, you know, one scout's workload isn't unmanageable. But yeah, we span out, we cover the entire country. We have two scouts to go over the top of those, um, those area scouts. Uh, There are national scouts. Uh, That would be uh, Mike Bonney and Sam Somerville. We just hired Sam. And then we've got Dale Thompson. Dale Thompson had been with us for a number of years. Dale was just promoted to our assistant college director. So he'll be working side by side with me. And I can't forget Patrick Wu, who's down in our department. Patrick is, is kind of, uh, he's the lifeblood of our entire department. We, we couldn't do what we do without him. He's such a great help to myself and all the scouts. But yeah, we, we get out there, we see the players in person. Like a lot of people think it's just going to games. Uh, we get the majority of our work done during the week when we go to practices. We learn so much more about these players going into the uh, football facilities over the course of the week, seeing them on a normal day, Uh, We get in there early, we meet with coaches, we interact with every person on that support staff there at that university that we're able to to get information from and then watch tape, go to practice, write a report, keep it rolling. So there's a lot of conversation around draft time about scouts being in schools and talking to different people and, you know, there's different meetings that you have throughout the course of the pre-draft process. But that's not necessarily the first interaction or touch point that you might have with a certain player. Is that correct? Sure. And during the fall, um, we have respect for the process and and the fact that these players have obligations to win Mm -hmm. for the schools that they play for. Uh, There are rules that prohibit certain contact with players in season. Um, But even if there weren't, there's a level of respect that we have for those programs that we're not going to, you know, get in a player's ear too early. 
Uh, but once the season's over with, games are played, they're done with their eligibility, mm -hmm. uh, we will start to develop relationships with these players at All-Star Games. Uh, that's our first time to really sit down and get to know what makes these guys tick. Mm -hmm. um, start to actually verify a lot of the background information that we've already gathered. You're gathering it from third party sources at the school, so it's really nice to get the player in front of you, maybe validate some of the information, or maybe it raises some new questions about the player that we didn't previously think about. Overall, how has the transfer portal affected college scouting for the Titans and for everybody else? It's affected things kind of at the end of the process. It's affected what players are in the draft in a given year. But honestly, with our process, it doesn't change anything. We need to evaluate every player. We don't know their intentions. Um, so when we are going to schools during the fall, we tr if they are eligible to enter the draft at the conclusion of the season, we treat that player the same. We don't make assumptions that this player may transfer. Um, we write them up. And if they happen to have another year of eligibility, transfer to another school, it's just an added bonus. That's just another year of evaluation that we have already gotten on that player. How do you interact with the general manager in terms of the information you gather? Because I'm fortunate enough to be in the office when I'm not on the road. Um, I, I like to hit about 50 schools a fall. Um, but in between those school visits, I'm, I'm in here. And, and I, it's a great benefit to be able to interact with RAN every day. We have conversations ongoing about players throughout the fall. Sometimes I'm out of school during the fall and I get excited. I can't even wait to get back to Nashville to tell them about it. So I'll shoot them a text, maybe give them a call from the hotel that night. Um, but it's a constant dialogue. It's a constant conversation. And, and RAN welcomes that. He asks for it. He wants it. Being on the road that much You've got to know all the best places to eat, right? <laughs> well, we do. Um, and I, you I, grew up with Seal Bricado around too. So. Yeah, I there's mean, no question. And he had a lot of he had a lot of places that he introduced me to. Some of them in Texas are still there, and I do go back to those. It's a dangerous game, though. You know, you got to be careful. Uh, you know, sometimes it's better to just find a salad. All right. So, does your brain ever stop working when it comes to college scouting? I think it has to during this short period of time over the summer that we get, we get five or six weeks to kind of recharge our batteries. If you're not careful, you roll right over into that next season and you, are, you, you haven't been rested, you're gassed mentally, physically. So I really try, and, and my family deserves this too. I've got, I've got a wife, uh, Sarah, who has been nothing short of amazing um, during the course of my career here and even before that. And then I've got two little boys, Evan and Tyler, and they deserve some time from their dad. So I really make it a point when we get those five weeks off to, yeah, I can't, I can't turn the phone off, but I really try to prioritize. Is this necessary that I address this right now versus is this something that can wait? That time belongs to them. So I will say the rest of the year, my, my mind is always on it. All right, so wrap up with this. The 2024 draft in the full rearview mirror now, how differently did it turn out than when you started working on it and thought it would be something back in 2023? I'd like to say that we, we saw it happening exactly the way it happened, and that's, that's not necessarily the case. Where we were picking in this draft, we knew we were going to get a good player. Um, you know, and... I think the talent pool in this draft made me feel very good about where we were picking first and second round. And, you know, if there's a year not to have a third round pick, you know, maybe that's okay. It's never the way you think. When you start out, when you start out at the beginning of the process, there's always players you have in your mind that you feel like this guy's, this guy's got a lot of hype around him. This guy's had production. You know, coaches are very high on this player, and, and you just got to let that process play out because a litany of things happen over the course of the fall that changes. You know, you've got injuries, you've got players that decide to return back to school, you've got transfers, you've got all these things that come up. There's no way to predict that. So we stay true to our system here. Uh, we've, got, we've got a very good system that RAN has helped implement, and we've got great support from Anthony Robinson, Chad Brinker, uh, I think we tell our scouts to just stay the course, continue in gathering information, because once you feel like you've got a player figured out, you're, gonna, you're bound to come across something that changes at the last minute. So I, I really feel good about 
kind of where we've come, but it never ends up. When that draft rolls around, they'd be lying to you if they said, oh, I saw it, I saw it this way the Headed whole time. All <laughs> exactly. Never the case. John Salgi, Director of College Scouting, thanks so much for the time. Thank you all. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So Titans fans can fan. All right, so we've done college scouting. We've done pro scouting. We sure have. I think we should go even deeper. Deeper. Even deeper in football minutia. Yeah, if you will. But here's what you're going to do. You're going to start talking about numbers, aren't you? I love numbers. Oh, I know you do. Oh. Sarah Bailey. Also loves numbers. She loves numbers. Director of football research and development for the Tennessee Titans. Welcome to the Bed MGM studio. Thank you. It's yes. nice to be here. You don't get out a lot, right? I don't get out a lot, no. <laughs> <laughs> football development and research could be substituted for analytics yes you're the you're the football analytics team leader yes okay so how did you get into this how did this become a th i mean did you grow up dreaming of doing football analytics no i didn't i feel like now it's more publicized where people know that it's actually a viable career um, but when i was going to school it, it was really only baseball analytics was the thing so I kind of just was going to school, had a math degree, and like my senior year, a professor was like, well, what do you want to do with it? And I'm like, it's a good question. I really like sports. Can I do something with that? And uh, things started to kind of fall in place when I realized that there was a career and I started looking into football and how underdeveloped it was. And to me, that was the most exciting part because really things you did were innovative. And so you could do research that was new and fresh and hopefully helpful. And so did you start somewhere specifically in football or did you start in baseball? No. So I got an internship with the San Diego Chargers at the time. Okay. Um, but I was doing digital media analytics. And so I was doing that. It was my internship and I really enjoyed it. The team was great there. But I, I kept being like, oh, I'd love to be in the football side. I'd love to be in the football side. Um, so I felt for myself personally that I need to go back to school. Um, so I went back to school. I got my master's in stats. And then I just saw a job posting for the Rams and it came up about a month or two before I was set to graduate. I applied, I interviewed, and kind of just got in through great. that. Yeah. So explain to me exactly what we do. Uh, everybody knows I'm not the numbers person. What are some of the ways that you're using some of the information that you gather to actually help a team do what they need to do? What are some of the spaces that we see? How about, let's do a football example first. Give okay, us a football great. example of analytics. Yeah, so I think a lot of people, probably a common one that's not a secret share is like fourth down stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do you optimize your fourth down decision making? There's a lot of things that go into what might, why, why a team might decide to go for it on fourth down. It's not as simple as like, oh, we're fourth and short, let's just go for it. There's sort of a risk and reward. And so I always view it kind of as a twofold where you can have a recommended chart, but I think a lot of information that comes from analytics, me personally at least, comes in like the actual analyzing of the information that you're doing. So you build this fourth down model where you say, okay, what's the likelihood we'll convert? What's the benefit if we do? What's the risk if we don't? Uh, but there's a lot of information within that process where you can say, okay, well, what really affects it? So you can teach the, not really teach, but you can tell the coaches or tell the person on the mic, like, hey, these variables are more impactful and they can really use their football knowledge, their master craft to sort of determine how the game's going in game and, and understand like, oh, this score differential kind of affects it more. Like, hey, we haven't converted on third down up to this point. Maybe we're a little bit less risk adverse than before. All right, so the non- on the field part of it. What's something in terms of analytics that you do, maybe preparing for the draft or free agency or anything like that? Yeah, I, I love the draft. It's personally one of my favorite parts. I think uh, particularly like the late rounds where you have all these players and all this potential and there's maybe not as much differentiation into a superstar, like at least on paper, but there are superstars in those rounds. We've seen it. And so how can we optimize that success? And how do we look at like all the work that the scouts have done because they're putting in the, the time and how can we use the data and the information that they've collected to really hone in on like, okay, what's important? What position is more likely to succeed? What traits of that position might have a little bit more success in the league and try and optimize our position? Do you have to sell that when you go in yeah. to like the scouts and the 
Oh, certainly. I mean, I think uh, it's fun coming here because it is relatively new. And so I've had to almost fine tune my skill set in communication too. And I'm, I'm certainly still growing, so it'll be a battle next year as well. But I think, uh, I think a lot of people are interested in. I think you have to have proof of concept too, where it's examples and everyone's going to always bring up the outlier that, well, this guy was such and such height and weight, so he's going to be successful. And so I think it's like, almost being prepared for those and understanding that like it is just a piece of the puzzle so I don't believe that I'm going to be wrong most of the time and I think that's just the case is understanding errors and understanding your your limitations too but just having that one percent that little piece that uh, can sometimes be a tiebreaker. Now you have a background in athletics right you were a track athlete, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> How does something like that, having an understanding of some of the outside elements that can impact any kind of athletic performance, how does that help you when you look at numbers? It gives you maybe like a frame of reference almost? Good question. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it particularly helps when you're dealing with like the sports science space. Mm -hmm. So when I started with the Rams, I actually started as a sports scientist. So I was working with their uh, medical staff and their trainers and looking at injury prevention and how to um, limit risk on players and optimize performance. And I think for me that really helps because you understand periodization and workload and really like what a schedule looks like, things you can control, things you can't control. Uh, and that helps kind of give meaningful information to the people that need to use use it. So I definitely think it has helped in a sense. <laughs> in terms of an NFL example, Vince Lombardi is always mentioned. It's the Lombardi trophy. Is there a Vince Lombardi type in analytics that you and others really look up to as the maybe the pioneer, somebody at the forefront of this? Um, I mean, I think most people are going to point to like Moneyball and sure. have that be like their aha moment Billy into Bean. into the league. And so I would say that that one's pretty consistent. I think in-house, you know, it really depends on like your passion. Are you interested in like the math? And in that case, you might really think your heroes are the researchers and the people that are at schools even that are doing this, like just grinding it for fun. And if you're interested in the sport performance, or you might look at teams that are really excelling at injury prevention and um, limiting that. So I think for the most part, most people are like, oh, Billy Bean for sure, 100%. But um, it, there's different nuances too. There's so many different ways that these numbers can be applied. Is there a space that's your most favorite? Because it sounds like you've worked in a lot of different areas and using numbers to predict a lot of different things. You know, I I like to say like I love the draft, but I also think like when I start doing other things, I'm like, oh, I love this. Like I'm working on a lot of coaching stuff right now and it's like, this is so interesting. So for me personally, I just, I love it all. Um, I think you see more impact in certain areas and that might motivate other people, but I also am of the frame of mind where if you can convert someone to, to an analyst believer, it's almost more rewarding. Um, so I don't, I don't think I have a very specific favorite. I think it's all really interesting. Um, I do think it's important like to get the exposure to all of it because if you understand how the pieces work together, like performance is it's related to scouting. You have to know if the players are injury adverse or not. Like coaching can somehow be related to players too. You want to know the size. You want to know what the players are looking for. Will they fit in the scheme? So I think it's important that you understand all three components so that you're able to do each one better. Selling Brian Callahan has not been a problem. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's a believer. Yes, yeah. Brian is great. Coach Callie is awesome. He came in and, you know, it's one of the emphasis was like, hey, how do these coaches respond to analytics? And he was just really open and had a lot of ideas that he was bringing from the Bengals that helped me kind of uh, help him in a way. And I've really enjoyed working with him and his staff and getting them the stuff that they need. And hopefully, you know, as we grow, like just draft just finished. So that's really been an emphasis lately, which is fun. How many people on your staff? Uh, currently, we're pretty slim. Uh, we are hiring, so we're, we're hopefully going to wrap up. There you up. go. Here, Amy, Amy's, Amy's ready. I can't do any <laughs> ready numbers, but I would love to come work with That's you. That's okay. You can clean She's data. a lot of fun sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. You can just tell me the stuff I need to do because yeah. it keeps going through the cracks. So. But it, Perfect. this just keeps mushrooming. Though, yeah, basically. yeah. So right now, you know, it's kind of... We sort of have two uh, pillars in our staff. So one is like football information, that's our development team. Um, and then there's like research and development, that's sort of me. Um, so right now it's me and then Matt is our kind of developer analyst. It's hybrid between the two, which is great. But we are gonna be adding two analysts and a data engineer. Oh, and that's great. Another developer for that seed. So 
we have a we're going to grow from two to four pretty quickly. That's good stuff. So if you're looking for someone to get involved in this. Is this, like kids who are going into college, is math the degree that they choose? Is there, what is kind of the path to get to this? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's no path. It's not like, I wish if I could write a book and it would be successful, I would be rich. So yeah. <laughs> it yeah, would be great. Would. Um, I think the, the path is really figuring out like your passion and being sort of open. I think if you're too kind of narrow-minded in one area, whether it's a sport or like a, like a aspect of it, then, you know, you, opportunity is so rare. Uh, that you're probably going to pigeonhole yourself a bit. Um, I always like to emphasize like more of a generic like statistics or math type of background versus like you know the specialized programs are awesome as well. Like they, there's they never had them when I was going in college. So like there's sports analytics programs. There's these things that are really like niche, which is great. Um, but I would say that, and then there's opportunities for research too. The NFL has a big data bowl. Um, that they host every year. The winners or the uh, finalists get to go to the combine. They get to present in front of coaches and uh, GMs and personnel staff. So, wait, the what is it? The data bowl? Big data bowl. Yeah, yeah. It, this just did not it's exist like when Chris I was in college. Bowl, it's it was like data. Yeah. Yeah. So you're given a set of data, like tracking data from the NFL, and you essentially have X amount of time to. Uh, to complete a project and usually you're given a prompt, you're given a track and you're... I could host that. This is incredible. I could host it. You could host it. Could be, it. It could be, be so My good game at it. show dream would come true. It's like a science fair it's for the NFL. They're going to love that we're pushing it too. Oh, this is the best. Here, here I am. I have a resume on me. I walk around <laughs> with one every day. He walks around with it. Every day. Sarah Bailey, director Football Research and Development. I got it right? Yes. That was really good. Thank you awesome. for sharing Thank all you. that with us. Thank you. Good Appreciate stuff. it. For Sarah Bailey and Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith with my resume right here in case <laughs> the NFL needs it. <laughs> We're both for getting new jobs. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for the OTP. Welcome to the big show where the legends go. Everybody knows it's time.